Africa. In the United States, the job guarantee is a key piece of the Green New Deal. Like a transition plan never really stuck because people were always afraid that they will lose their scarce fossil fuel jobs and there will be nothing on the other end. But now there is a guarantee that you will be transitioned, that, you know, that is part of the policy response that a green economy will guarantee jobs for those who lose them in the fossil fuel economy. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard Professor of Economics and author of The Case for a Job Guarantee, Pavlina Chernova. And in a moment, we're going to be hearing a conversation between Pavlina and MMT scholar Phil Armstrong at an online event which took place on the 24th of January 2021. In the show notes, I've linked to the website of the organisers of the event, our associates, the Gower Initiative for Modern Money Studies, and their website is also where you can sign up for email alerts about upcoming events and support them financially, and it's also where you'll soon be able to see video of this event. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes where me and Patricia lay out the basics in an easy to understand way. But if you want to dive in here, as you're about to hear, both Pavlina and Phil are excellent teachers of economics, so you're in good hands. In the conversation, Pavlina mentions endogenous money, and that can be a tricky concept for people who are new or newish to MMT to grasp. So we have a whole episode explaining it, and that's our episode 43 with Sam Levy. Pavlina also touches on the birth of the euro and we talk about the problems arising from the eurozone member nation's lack of what academics call monetary sovereignty and an MMT informed solution proposed by Pavlina and Dr. Dirk Entz is laid out in our episode 55. And Pavlina also talks about the influence of primary MMT academic Professor L. Randall Ray, who was our guest in episode 53, and that's really worth a listen. So I've linked to all of the above in the show notes, along with all of our episodes with Phil and Pavlina, and to where you can get hold of their books. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month, which is 73 British pence at the time of recording. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all our episodes and patron only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. We are 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending as to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too so thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding mmt and thanks again to sarah claire and prue from gims for organizing the event we start with opening remarks from prue let's dive in good afternoon everybody uh in these really dark days and uh, gloomy days which reflect both the month at least in the northern hemisphere and the times we are living through the gims team is absolutely delighted to extend a very warm welcome to today's guest pavlina cherneva whether you are an old hand or someone new to modern monetary theory we are sure that today's event will be both informative and inspiring and just what we need to rally our spirits for the challenges ahead. For newcomers, uh, you can follow us on social media and our website is packed full of useful resources for those wishing to extend and refine their knowledge. You can also sign up too for our newsletter for updates or donate. We are all unpaid volunteers, so any help you can give to keep our organisation kicking over will be appreciated. We'd also like to give yet another plug for the MMT podcast hosted by Kevin Riley and Giacchino, which is well worth a browse for a fascinating insight into MMT 
and its application to real life for beginners and old hands alike. To reach a port, we must set sail. Sail, not tie at anchor. Sail, not drift. These words have been attributed to Franklin D. Roosevelt, who most people will know was the architect of the New Deal, which aimed to stabilize the US economy and provide jobs and relief to those that were suffering as a result of the Great Depression, which occurred after the financial crash in 1929. Its implementation oversaw a huge expansion of government intervention, especially its role in the economy. In his first inaugural address at Washington's Capitol Plaza in 1933, in the darkest days of the depression, he said, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And he promised to act swiftly to face, and I quote, the darkest realities of the moment. Whilst times have now moved on and the world is a vastly different place, those words are every much applicable to our times as they were in the 1930s. Politically, economically and environmentally, we are at a critical moment in history and COVID-19 has drawn public attention to the failure of the dominant economic paradigm in a painful and observable way. With its focus on sound finance and driven by an unswerving faith in a destructive economic ideology, the human environmental cost has proved immeasurable. It has taken the arrival of COVID-19 to bring about a swift shift in focus, opening the public purse to the tune of billions of pounds to support the economy and the lives of those directly affected by the pandemic, even if that support has been patchy and very selective. As governments around the world have been forced to spend huge sums, vast sums to keep their economies from collapsing, it has reignited a debate about how government actually spends. As such, this is an important moment for the international MMT movement to keep this discussion thriving in both political and public arenas, particularly as politicians, economists and the media are still framing spending in the household budget terms of sound finance. With the Chancellor of the Exchequer already preparing the nation for yet more hard choices in the form of tax increases and public sector pay freezes to restore the public finances, the how are you going to pay for it model is still alive and well and will do huge damage to an already battered econ economy should he choose to pursue such policies. The scourge of unemployment, underemployment and insecure working practices will, without government action, continue to form a destructive feature of our economies. And so, therefore, we need with great urgency to reset our thinking. At the top of this discussion must be the restoration of full employment as a policy choice, not just to deal with the fallout from the current crisis and readjust the imbalance of economic power, which currently favours capital, but also as an important mechanism to manage a just transition as we face the challenges posed by climate change. Given those challenges in mind, it is therefore an absolute pleasure to welcome our guest, Pavlina Cherneva, who is a Programme Director and Associate Professor of Economics at Bard College, a Research Associate at the Levy Economics Institute, 
and a member of the GIMS Advisory Board. Her work on the job guarantee spans over 20 years and in her recently published book, The Case for a Job Guarantee, she challenges us to imagine a world where the phantom of unemployment is banished and anyone who seeks decent living wage work can find it guaranteed. It is therefore a timely opportunity to explore it further as we grapple with the economic con consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, seek solutions to the rising poverty and inequality which preceded its arrival and continue the pace and face the biggest challenge of all, climate change. So without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to hand you over to Pavlina and Phil. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Prue, for the introduction. I, I, uh, I've got this um, text along the bottom, which uh, say, you know brings your message to me, but it doesn't recognise MMT, uh, which is quite interesting. It was talking about our empty community <laughs> instead of MMT community. Now, obviously, we know it's not empty. It's getting fuller all the time. But hopefully, after a while, the, this computer technology, MMT will be so well known that instead of putting empty you'll put mmt all the time and then we'll have to wait and see whether that actually occurs now uh, the community is growing and we've got one of its leading lights in pavlina uh, and it's a great pleasure for me to interview her and to ask her some questions we're all looking forward to that especially me uh now it, my first question is uh, just to uh, whet the listeners viewers appetites um i'm going to ask pavlina really to tell us all how she came across this wonderful thing called mmt you know she may have been you know well she's still young but she may have been very young when she she spotted it what's her story what's the pavlina mmt story uh and Alongside that, importantly, what is it about MMT that Pavlina thinks is most powerful? What has kept her in it, if you like? So uh, that's your first question, Pavlina. What's your MMT story? Thank you, Phil, so much and approved for the lovely introduction. Of course, to Gims for the invitation. I've been uh, looking forward to this for some time. So thanks. Um, it's a really good question. I, I don't think anyone has asked me what has kept you uh, with MMT throughout the process just yet. Like yeah, I have told the story of how I came to MMT, um, <clears throat> mostly through my graduate studies. But let me answer it this way. I mean, it was, you know, mind blowing. It was earth shattering. I think that was the first, the first thing I felt about it when I was introduced to some of these ideas. Um, I was a graduate, I was an undergraduate student um, at Gettysburg College. And uh, at the time, um, the two most influential faculty that I had were Matt Forstatter, whom your audience might know, and uh, someone else who doesn't get mentioned very often, Derek Gonway, uh, has uh, since passed. But uh, the, those two faculty taught me that there is more than one way of thinking about the economy. Uh, it's something you don't typically get in a traditional uh, training and education. You kind of get the standard neoclassical model. You don't even get uh, economic history, uh, but we got history of thought. And so I, with them, with Matt and Derek, I studied Veblen, I studied Keynes, Minsky, Smith. I mean, you know, uh, the traditions. And that was, those were some of the most like, exciting uh, classes. And I think that, they had, you know, they taught me that you have to entertain different ideas. So that was the very first, very first lesson. Um, you know, at the time I was an international student, you know, didn't know anyone looking for an internship, trying to get a job. And Matt, again, uh, connected me to Warren Mosler, who was um, on the post Keynesian list server as as. Uh, people know discussing with Matt, with Randy, with Bill, some of these, uh, some of you know his ideas, and so he was looking for a student to you know help do research for him, and you know Matt suggested my name, so I may have been his first researcher apart from Arthur Laffer, who I think wrote the preface yeah, to yeah. some <laughs> software. Yeah, <laughs> 
<laughs> and I, you know, um, you know, laugh, I didn't stick with it, as you know. <laughs> no. Um, so, um, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, clearly not. <laughs> yeah. But uh, at the time, right, he wrote Software's Economics completely independently from, you know, engaging with the academia and, um, you know, so much of it was familiar and rung true, especially the stuff on endogenous money. And some of it did not. Some of it was completely, you know, foreign to me. And, um, you know, I, I wrote my first paper called the critical review of soft currency economics to see, you know, whether this holds water. But there was a big intellectual tradition, Phil, as you know, you know, the post Keynesian yeah. tradition that... Um, that actually has been articulating some of these ideas, but really not fully and completely, I think, as we now come to understand that there were pieces that were missing. You know, the state's role in creating money was just not there. I mean, you, will, you can find it. It's not entirely untrue. Um, you know, you, you can still find in the circuitous school, uh, you know, discussion of, of a government um, issuing, being part of the circuit, you know, issuing liabilities, but it wasn't theoretically you know, incorporated. Um, certainly, I mean, the, the second paper that I wrote for, for Warren, and it was just, I was really kind of playing around with this idea that, okay, if the government can tax, you know, give you a certain tax liability and then spends a certain amount of money and that that um, actually, the tax liability brings resource to the public sector, which the government then employs, then what would be the rate at which the government could be employing those resources and how many resources could it bring forth to the public sector? So for me, actually, it was, you know, just the question, can we formalize this a little bit and, you know, plant the seeds for what might be a price theory, if you will. And so the second paper was the um, um, the model, the, the, the basic math model of full employment, employment and price stability. And, uh, the pricing function of the public sector, I would say, might be still underappreciated. Even today, as you notice, how like people are, you know, paying attention to MMT, grasping the concept that there might not be limits to government spending, that there's a lot more policy space, the space, the debt and the deficit. Uh, might not be typical concerns, you know, and even that is misunderstood, but that seems to resonate with people. They're starting to, to quite, you know, to, to pay attention. But I have not really seen outside of our circle a recognition of the pricing power of the, of the government sector. So, uh, you know, I really appreciate your paper with Warren on the Weimar Republic um, yeah. that, you know, really teases that out. Because everybody, you know, raises that question, you know, oh, well, you know, you run away spending and printing and you're going to end up with Zimbabwe or Weimar. So there is quite a bit of, uh, of work to be done, I think, on the pricing uh, part. And those were the first two questions that were intriguing to me intellectually. Um, you know, they were somewhat uh, abstract. Uh, you know, I was... Uh, you know, a macro always appealed to me a lot, a lot more. Stabilization policy. This is where I entered into the job guarantee work. Um, you know, from this macro bird's eye view. Um, uh, you know, finding finding it compelling as a as a policy stabilization policy. But you know, in terms of the personal journey um, that summer when I worked for Warren in '96. We organized um, the first, you know, you know, MMT conference, maybe you can call it that way, in Bretton Woods, um, where we basically presented a macroeconomic framework for analysis. I mean, that's it, that's what it was called at that time. It was an MMT. It was just a macroeconomic analytical framework. A lot of people from finance joined, you know, through Warren circles. They understood. They could follow the money. They understood balance sheets. Um, you know, that stuff was very easy to to grasp. Um, you know, how the Fed, the Treasury operated just by virtue of their daily work. Um, we did bring in uh, some of the big guns from post Keynesian theory. Paul Davidson yeah. was there. Um, of course, Randy Ray and uh, Basil Moore. Mm -hmm. And Randy Ray, I had I had read as an undergraduate student. I had never met, yeah. and um, I may have relayed this story before. Mm -hmm. But you know, I came down to dinner with Warren and some guests. Uh, on the first day of the, the conference and I came in a little late. So he was talking to this, this person um, 
And through the course of the conversation, I realized that this was Randall Ray and his wife was there, young, beautiful. She was expecting, you know, mm -hmm. one child, expecting another child. And, you know, Ray was also reasonably young. And I had always imagined him as like somebody in the zenith of his career. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> <laughs> As he's yeah. written so much and so such influential work and to me it was influential and so I, I was you know it was very personally for me you know extremely motivating to meet those those people uh, and to have access to them and just to talk to them but one odd character in that conference was uh, somebody called Bernard Connolly who's a British yeah. uh, hedge fund guy right never heard of him <laughs> well you know he worked for Thatcher, I think. All right. Actually, pretty conservative guy. Mm -hmm. And he may have, um, he worked for uh, in some, he was somehow in the, uh, 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 you know, maybe in government, I'm not mm -hmm. sure, official position, but he was then appointed chief economist for the European Commission. And he wrote a book called The Dirty or the Rotten Heart of Europe, where uh, he basically, I mean, it's a little conspiratorial, but he made a couple of a, a couple of important points. The first thing is the lack of monetary sovereignty. You know, the European project cannot work because it does not permit monetary sovereignty. And then he exposed it as a political project that this was, you know, if you remember, um, you know, the French economist who said, you know, Europe will become one by one currency alone. Like that was the yeah. path they chose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They didn't choose another way of integrating. They chose a very particular structural um, approach to integrating through one currency. And he, you know, he exposed how devastating that could be to national sovereignty. But, um, you know, not really going further into some of the economic you know, problems with it. And I think this might be the reason, one of the reasons why Thatcher chose not to join, right? That there were voices in, in the government and they were not all conservative voices. You know, um, Charles Goodhart was part of this conference. Yeah. Um, you know, as you know, he's written on, um, you know, money and the you know, two views of money, uh, you know, a, a very important piece. Uh, that he wrote in 98, right around the time when, you know, we used to interact a lot with Charles Goodhart. In my early days, I, he was, you know, like having dinners and just listening to him. It was very, uh, very influential also and important for me. But uh, Bernard Connolly, he was the historian for our conference. And it was in 96. And it was very interesting because I'm originally from Bulgaria. You know, now, yeah. now I live in the U.S. I have family. And, you know, I haven't, uh, I haven't been in, in, engaged a lot with Bulgarian policy. But at that time, Bulgaria was joining a currency board. We had experienced hyperinflation in 1996. And like that was a very interesting question for me. You know, what is the role of the public sector in, uh, in, in, in this broken, you know, monetary system that has, you know, this runaway inflation, hyperinflation, and um, they managed to choke it off eventually through the, through the currency board. And, um, and, you know, there are multiple things going on. It wasn't really it wasn't really the public sector runaway spending. You know, it was unsecured credit. It was a ratchet effect. It was, the, you know, the private sector kind of looting the banks, uh, extending credit uh, to no end. In fact, it was the absence of the public sector. <laughs> that yeah. was, was the reason for, for this. <laughs> And, you know, as you explain also, uh, similar to Weimar, you know, we didn't have the productive capacity, you know, coming out of a, you know, communist uh, regime um, attempting, I mean, it, I think first of it, it was fraud, like hyperinflation was very much fraud and financing new ventures, privatization schemes, pyramid schemes with, you know, private credit. Um, and second, it, we just didn't have a, a production response. You know, if, if there were there were people like my family trying to go and buy bread every morning and in the evening, the bread was was, you know, much more expensive. So it wasn't like, you know, you could actually satiate that demand. But there was also the, the, the payment, the ratchet effect of just prices automatically adjusting. So I, um, you know, at the time, those papers that I wrote for Warren, I had sent them to many economists, um, many famous economists, mm -hmm. uh, um, 
and you know lots of the post Keynesian, you know, or you know, uh, you know, Orthodox folk. Um, Bernard Connolly, you know, I received a lot of letters back. Bernard's was one where you know he says, Pavlina, it's critically important that you go back to Bulgaria and you tell them not to do the currency board and you stop. <laughs> you know, and I'm like this college kid <laughs> thinking, you know, now yeah. I'm going to knock on the door of the government. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm saying this story because it was just crystal clear to me that um, like it has an emor- enormous uh, em- uh, uh, emancipatory potential, like MMT, like to, to allow you to look at all of these um, you know, economic problems that are happening and major transformations. I mean, the euro was in its infancy, right? We hadn't even yeah. properly launched it. It was being planned. And that this could potentially be an enormous train wreck for the entire continent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, apart from the fact that the abstract notions were truly like, you know, very, you know, very engaging intellectually, it was also, you know, that they offered different answers to so many problems that um, that I was I was watching. And so, you know, just very quickly to wrap up my, you know, how I got to it was, you know, eventually we set up uh, with Warren and Matt, the Center for Full Employment and Price Stability at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, um, where I uh, ended up doing my PhD. Um, We had hired uh, Randy Ray and Stephanie and Fred Lee. And um, then I pursued my PhD there and, uh, you know, uh, undertook a research program. Um, And so... What, you know, what kept me with those those things uh, that, uh, you know, we continue to, you know, to offer new answers. And, you know, I think, you know, a fresh look. I think the fact that MMT is being mainstreamed speaks to the, the enormous, uh, I think, uh, potential that it has. You know, I've, I've, you know, I come out of a heterodox tradition, a mar- marginalized heterodox mm-hmm. tradition. And it's always, you know, always a big question. Why do the institutionalists who crafted policy during the New Deal era, as Pru was saying, you know, who were very influential in crafting Social Security and some of the New Deal programs, why did that influence wane? And to me, they offer some of the most compelling still intellectual mm-hmm. work. Right. You know, post Keynesians attempted to to carry forward the the Keynesian flag. They still have important forgotten messages from Keynes that they, you know, that they emphasize. And they're coming back again now a little bit through uh, this rediscovery of of the potential of fiscal power. But MMT kind of plowed through after the great financial crisis. And I think, uh, you know, made a lot more progress faster. So hopefully we can keep up, you know, the momentum. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, your enthusiasm, uh, Pavlina, shines through. You know, you've, uh, I mean, I think fired people up in the audience. And and I I absolutely agree with you. I mean, this idea of MMT powering through. And it's true that some heterodox guys have sort of, well, I'd be wrong, maybe said they've joined in, but they've they've gone with it. And others have obviously tried to put the the brakes on a bit. You know, there's certain elements of post Keynesians, you know, that are, I don't know, try to resist the MMT juggernaut. I mean, my sense is they're fighting a losing battle. But I do agree with you. There's a lot of insight in in institutionalism and uh, in Paul's Keynes and Marxists. And I'm very much in pluralism. I did interview Charles Goodhart, actually, in my book. And he's got a lot of sympathy for MMT. But he's got that twinkle in his eye. He doesn't like, as you'll know very well, he doesn't like to be labelled. Uh, he likes to just be like himself, a very modest, kind guy. Uh, yeah, and uh, the point you made before about the um, the insight about the prices being a, a function of the state, you know, uh, necessarily as the monopoly issue of the currency, I think is very important and something that perhaps hasn't been as stressed in in MMT as perhaps it ought to be. So obviously I, I know something Warren uh, has pushed a lot and uh, it was a great pleasure for me to persuade him to write that Weimar paper with me. So I'm very pleased that uh, I managed to get him to do that. Um, obviously, uh, Pavlina, your book, The Case for the Job Guarantee, has been a massive success. I mean, it... it um, I really enjoyed reading that, you know, very well received. In terms of the longer 
impact since? How how would you gauge the like the knock on effect from 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 publishing that book? Yeah, I mean, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for saying that. And yes, there has been a lot of interest in the proposal, and I have found a lot of international interest in the proposal as well. I think, um, I mean, what people are starved for new solutions uh, to uh, labor market problems as well, and you know. Every crisis is a teachable <laughs> moment, you know, like that yeah, yeah. every yeah. Time crisis is a teachable moment. Every crisis, you know, COVID has exposed the fault lines in the economy, the inequality. Mm -hmm. it, and it's the exact same thing that, you know, we said in 2008, right? Yeah, and yeah. time after time. And one of the, I think that uh, certainly we said that, you know, during, uh, you know, um, you know, during the 70s, you know, but what's interesting to me is that the labor market has been left on the back burner. Labor market concerns have been left uh, behind. And, you know, maybe now there's a little bit of a realization that if you don't pay attention to how we create jobs, how we create good jobs, and how to ensure that they're accessible to all, we will not be successful in our stabilization efforts. I think that that, I hope, is coming through. But... Uh, you know, in 2008, for example, in the United States, uh, and that was a typical approach, I think, in other countries, you know, the goal was to stabilize the financial sector. You know, the financial sector was the source of the problem, and they were the beneficiaries of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of stabilization efforts. Yeah. And in that entire approach, um, you know, we didn't really hear almost anything about working people with the exception of extension of unemployment insurance, you know, providing some uh, tax relief to payroll taxes. And for the most part, we uh, government budgets ballooned as they do in every recession. And and still we got a, you know, pitifully small impact on labor markets. And so, you know, 10, 11, 12 years later, you know, we're talking about we're back to full employment, which is, you know, I think it's another very pernicious kind of uh, term in economics because full employment can mean anything you want it to mean. It could mean 20% unemployment. It could mean 3% unemployment. And, you know, yes, unemployment had come down to historically low levels earlier last year, but we know that that doesn't tell you the story about what people are feeling. We know that, at least in the United States, about 42% of jobs earn below $15 an hour. You can't live on that, okay? 42% so below 50. So they're very low wage jobs. And, um, you know, we have occasional work, precarious labor market, the gigification, the whole nine yards, right? We know that working, the working experience is very different from the working experience in the early post-war era, where people got jobs and stable jobs, folks who didn't dream you know, to have, you know, the white picket fence and the 2.5 cars and, you know, the standard of living, they actually got it. You know, their grandparents lived in abject poverty, their parents, but they they were able to jump and increase the standard of living, send their kids to college and just uh, live, uh, you know, so to, speak, so to speak, the American dream. This was once again, you know, kind of the white American dream. It was a very unequal kind of um, uh, process, you know, we still had uh, segregation. This American dream was not accessible to very many people. However, it showed that it can be done, that we can kind of transform the labor market and thus transform our communities as a consequence because the incomes and the jobs engendered a different life. You know, they provided life in rural areas where life had left them, you know, economic life had left them. So then come the 70s, we kind of give up the little pretense of, of government employment and investment that, that we had, we now move on to, you know, nudges and various other government policies that attempt to stimulate the private sector to do the right thing. And the result of that experiment for the last 50 years is runaway inequality, the increasing loss of support for working people, people um, uh, the gigification, uh, you know, the the rise of occasional work, you know, the, the independent contractor, etc. So the question is, like, where do we go from here now? You know, how? How do we actually provide folks with some support? Like, do we 
have a structural policy that can give us a new social contract. You know, the old days, the social contract is you're going to work for Ford, you know, the, the factory for 30 years. You're going to, you know, give a good chunk of your life in service to that, that company. And then that company is going to take care of you. It's going to pay your family wages. It's going to pay your retirement. And, you know, you can retire comfortably. Well, that's long gone. You know, we know that, you know, those companies don't even provide, you know, the retirement support. And that's why we have a public option for retirement. We have social security. We know that at a minimum, that would be guaranteed to um, uh, retirees. With employment, what would be the new social contract to ensure that people have some sort of power and leverage when they go into the workplace, that they will have good conditions and good wages. And we really don't have, you can't force companies to do it. You know, you can't nudge them into, uh, you know, reversing course and providing better stable employment. So the, the job guarantee is a structural policy that provides a floor um, much the same way that it has done for other aspects of economic insecurity, right? If the private sector will not provide you decent retirement uh, and accessible to all, the public sector will. We use, you know, the, uh, the example of, of education. If the private sector doesn't provide guaranteed education uh, for accessible to all, it's the public sector's job to do it, right? Um, you know, you can extend that argument uh, clearly to healthcare, and many, most advanced countries have, you know, a public option, a universal care, actually, na you know, a nationalized care. The United States doesn't. But that's the way to think about these fundamental aspects of economic insecurity and a job, having an access to a job is one of them. One uh, essential ticket for self-determination, well-being, supporting yourself, your family. So the job guarantee would be also that kind of public option that you know that you can be scrambling and searching in the private sector, looking for work, but there is always the guarantee that at a minimum, a basic job with basic wages and benefits will be secured for you, rain or shine. And that, you know, has the benefit of lifting up the floor and providing kind of a stepping stone um, for people as they, uh, you know, seek, uh, seek employment. So it's a transitional program for employment, number one. Um, but it has also uh, many different uh, benefits. And I think what has you know, what has resonated, you know, um, with many people is that it is a piece that, for example, that it is part, it connects very nicely to other, to other um, um, social goals or objectives. For example, the environmental movement, you know, in the United States, the job guarantee is a key piece of the Green New Deal. Yeah. Um, and and that was a missing piece. It just, it never stuck. Like a transition uh, plan never really stuck because people were always afraid that they will lose their precious and scarce fossil fuel jobs and there will be nothing on the other end. But now there is a guarantee that you will be transitioned, that, you know, that is part of the policy response that um, um, a green economy will guarantee jobs for those who lose them in the fossil fuel economy. Others in Europe, for example, conversations with, you know, committees from, you know, European Commission, you know, they have, uh, you know, in Europe, there are public health deserts. Actually, in the US, we have public health deserts. You know, there are communities that don't have access to, to basic, you know, health care or easily accessible health care. So as, as those communities are re-envisioning how to provide those public investments, they are now connecting that work with public employment. Yeah. Um, you know, the... Coastal areas as well. I mean, that's part of the environmental problem. Housing, you know, in the U.S., um, folks who are working on 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 homelessness, they understand that that work to guarantee decent housing is actually also connected with the work of guaranteeing decent employment. We have these um, interesting programs in small cities. For example, Albuquerque's mayor runs one for homeless people that basically. Um, takes homeless folks and puts them to public service projects. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after they go to work, then they are transitioned to housing and then they move them to 
uh, public housing and they find that the employment component is the reason why people are able to hold on to the to the job and the home and actually it eradicates homelessness so the job and it is a key component of eradicating homelessness who would have thought yeah. so so the reason why i think the job guarantee has um has been embraced by different corners is because everything's connected to everything yeah. And uh, and uh, having a job and a decent job is really critically important uh, to address many different social deprivations. Um, you know, you know what? As a macroeconomist, for me, what has been very important is to emphasize that you just can't have an economy that operates on unemployment and expect that to be a more stable economy than if you have an economy that runs with a buffer stock employment program. Um, the comparison is, you know, it's it's very straightforward. It's much better to, you know, to uh, to expend resources, financial and real, to have a job guarantee program than all of the other um, social and economic costs associated with unemployment. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a, a huge supporter of the job guarantee, and uh, I think that it, in many ways, uh, it's strange. Well, I'll. My daughter actually uh, transcribed my book when I was interviewing uh, lots of economists of different types, post Keynesians, Marxists, as I said. And uh, as she was transcribing it, she said to me, hey, Dad, I really like this job guarantee. She's a philosophy undergraduate. But she didn't understand why most of the economists, even if they were vaguely sympathetic to MMT, didn't like it because to her, What's not to like about the job guarantee? This is the puzzle. And I still find it quite unusual that even people who do maybe reluctantly admit that MMT might be onto something with this, uh, you know, the government spends first, et cetera, the, the, mon the operational reality monetary system. There's quite a lot of um, opposition to the job guarantee. And to me, it's totally misplaced and in many ways puzzling. Uh, now, what I've actually got, I don't know if you've got the questions in front of you, uh, Pavlina. Well, OK, well, basically, I've got a lot of questions that were sent by the, the Gins girls, and I'm going to go through those. Uh, now, you might, my job really is to, if, if, if uh, you answer another question early, I don't ask you the same question twice. So basically, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate a bit, uh, asking the types of questions that people who maybe don't like the job guarantee or they don't understand it, they might ask. So for you to, in a way, bat them away. Well, in the cricket is our game, bat them away to the boundary. I don't know, in, in a baseball sense, to hit them out of the ballpark, really. So the first question uh, on the job guarantee I've got is uh, that there are concerns that the job guarantee might be used to replace uh, existing public sector jobs and therefore, you know, maybe trade unions wouldn't like it. Uh, and how could... Uh, the organisers of a job guarantee scheme allay those fears by laying out, you know, this is what it's going to work. It won't affect, you know, the public sector sort of original job structure within the public sector. Okay, so I mean, obviously, it's a this is a question of design and uh, <clears throat> the job here. So just let's back up a little bit. Yeah. Um, the job guarantee is a public option in the sense that if you walk into an unemployment office, you can walk out with a job, okay? Yeah, yeah. Now, um, what a lot of folks are concerned about is that there are some very legitimate public service work that is uh, under-provisioned and under-staffed. And so often, um, you know, folks who are uh, attracted to the job guarantee um, would say, well, let's just guarantee those jobs in, you know, health services or in, you know, if, you know, government offices. And to me, that is a very good um, approach to get the public sector to employ people as needed at the appropriate skill level and wage level in the appropriate places for ongoing public sector work, full stop. There is a, there's, Always going to be still, though, a program, uh, a need to provide for 
um, you know, for people who are having the, the greatest difficulty in the labor market. So mm. a floor. So what I would say is that you have to kind of separate first what the job guarantee is attempt attempting to do. You know, in my ideal world, I keep saying, you know, you, you hire, you get authorize the government to hire as many people as necessary in all federal, local, um, you know, public agencies as needed. But there will be still people coming and knocking on the door like, looking for work. And usually those are the most vulnerable people, um, you know, folks who the private sector, for one reason or another, does not want to hire. You know, and I can tell yeah. you who they are in the United yeah. States. You know, it's it's people of color. It's, um, you know, folks who may not have college education. Um, it's going to be caregivers who've been out of the labor force for a very long time. They don't have a work experience to show for. And they have the hardest time actually being called back to an interview. You know, they've been at home caring uh, for children or um uh, sick parents, etc., And then they, they try to enter the, the labor force and they have great obstacles. Um, people with disabilities are going to have extraordinary difficulty. And so um, there has to be a guarantee that at a minimum, a living wage job offer is there uh, for anyone. And so then then you can do whatever placement that comes with it. You know, after you do your job on the job, training in the job guarantee. Part of the component of the job guarantee is to help folks transition to uh, opportunities that are more suited for their, um, for them and for their skill and know-how. So we always say that the job guarantee is a transitional program. It's not necessarily true that the person has to transition into private sector employment. They can transition into better paid public sector employment, yeah. right? It's still a better buffer stock than unemployment because when a understaffed government agencies looking for a skilled person and they cannot find that skilled person, it's still better to have somebody from the job guarantee. Let me give you an example in the United States. It's a very egregious example. The US uh, permits the use of prison labor um, for various projects, infrastructure, you know, and, and it pays cents on the dollar, right? The prison labor is not subject to minimum wages. So people can get a dollar to go and fight fires in California. And if you've been watching the news, every year California gets incinerated, massive fire devastation, right? So what does the state do? The state doesn't use its public sector employers. It doesn't uh, hire firefighters with good wages and benefits. It uses prison labor to uh, send to fight fires. Now that's a skill, a very important skill. When somebody is released from prison, they have extraordinary difficulty finding employment because they have a record. So here's what you, we have. We have an ideology that says the government can't do the job. Thus the government is starved of the funds. And then the government is then resorting to the private sector slavery practices in prison, right? Yeah. To do the job. Now, if we flip that and say, how about we have a modern government fire prevention uh, structure program that will be staffed um, with good bit benefits and wages, but that will also be a program that will give you on the job training for the trainee that comes in, yeah. learns in the school skills, the tools of the trade, and then they get placed into public sector projects that uh, are in other parts of the uh, country, Oregon, Washington, that need the same kind of work. So think of the job guarantee as the minimum that somebody will get, and then they will be then transitioned elsewhere. You do this by design. It's it's not like a, a, we don't have to invent like a new model. We, there's all sorts of programs that government says this cannot displace a traditional worker that is there employed. It has to be an additional job, right? The job guarantee has to be an additional job. As a, I, I will give you, you know, I've been looking at um, um, at the India National mm -hmm. Rural Employment Guarantee mm -hmm. uh, program, which is fascinating to learn about. But there is a very clear mandate that the job, and it's the largest job guarantee program in the world, tens, 55 million people last year were employed in it, okay? So, um, so the government says, your, your uh, community is going to propose new projects. Nothing that is done by the local city, nothing that is done by the ministries, the Ministry of Agriculture, of Infrastructure, whatever, it's gonna be a new project. And then you're going to approve it. You're going to uh, propose those missing jobs. 
And then uh, you will employ whoever shows up uh, for work. So there are many different ways of doing it, but you do it by decree. Uh, you know, part of the quality control would be that, you know, the local uh, city council cannot fire its administrative staff and then rehire people at the lower wage. It's just a very basic quality control thing that exists in all sorts of grant making, all sorts of public policy design. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Pavlina. Um, uh, I'll move on to another one of the questions that comes up. I mean, some people have said, oh, well, it's like workfare, you know. So in other words, like you, you, I assume, well, built into the job guarantee for people who can't work or unable to work will be a, a reasonable quality of income for them to maintain a dignified life. And then the job guarantee would be, would be separate of that. But people say, oh, well, won't there be some sort of pressure for people who, you know, they've got to be made to work or they won't won't get their basic income. How would you answer that? So oh, it's a form of slavery, a form of workfare argument that is quite common, particularly on the right, but also on, on some aspects of the left. I mean, look, um, people are confusing direct employment with a job guarantee. Mm -hmm. Direct employment can be done under any circumstance, right? You can have yeah. slavery as direct employment, yeah. right? So the job guarantee is a voluntary program. If you're making people work for their existing benefits and if you remove those benefits unless and until they show up, that's not job guarantee. It's not a guarantee, it's a job compulsion. So right. people are, are, are confusing the two. Of course, there are plenty of terrible programs out there. You know, we know that Viktor Orban is running something like this. And it's yeah, very yeah. punitive and it pays uh, low wages. And it also creates social antagonism because, you know, like the no good folks have to demonstrate that they are deserving of the benefits that the government is um, uh, is supporting, is expending. But at the same time, in those rural areas, those, you know, you know what they call no good folks that uh, are actually doing good work, but under, yeah. you know, poverty paying yeah, wages, yeah. So the communities like it. Right. Yeah. And so you have this social antagonism that creates support for authoritarian governments um, because the folks that don't work in the program actually benefit from from the workfare yeah. program. That's workfare. And and so my uh, argument has always been unless the left like, you know, wakes up and sees that there is a, a democratic emancipatory way of doing this. Authoritarians will very often resort to direct employment for p political purposes. That's not a job guarantee. That's job compulsion. A job guarantee would be something similar to the zero unemployment areas in France. Right. It's also a very interesting experiment, very successful. Um, last year, the government unanimously increased, uh, voted to increase it fivefold. Um, and it is basically an experiment where, where communities um, on voluntary basis, they are uh, creating employment opportunities through public employment companies, some social entrepreneurial ventures uh, for the long-term unemployed. And uh, they're transitioning them to employment, but it is from the ground up and the community and the towns are figuring out where the need is. Mm. Um, in, you know, in some uh, cases, it's environmental work. In some cases, it's work for the elderly. Um, you know, there are lots of examples. I'm actually writing a, a, a paper on this right now, but I mean, the, the rural employment guarantee in India is, is very interesting because it is, it's actually based on um, open forums where citizens come in, you know, they have a structure, like a grassroots democratic governance structure in their villages that exists. And through these open forums, people come in and they deliberate what jobs they're going to be creating. And that is a very democratic process because you want to engage the people who will be benefiting from the program in the, the very work that they will be doing. So that's what the job guarantee is. So it's not work fair. Um, and I think we have been clear and articulate. There are some dishonest kind of uh, uh, mischaracterizations on the, on the left in the US mm -hmm. that um, you are adding a uh, a job requirement to your unemployment benefit is a very like warped way of yeah. thinking about this. It's, it's like you can go and get unemployment if you want, but if you want the job guarantee, it will be there. Number right. one, there is though that other argument which um, the left uh, has advanced that you know, in in capitalism, you know, uh, wage work is commodifying labor, and by inherently it's wrong. 
And yeah. the job guarantee inherently perpetuates that system. It's a philosophical argument. I'm sympathetic to it. But if you pay attention to how um, the job guarantee is proposed through the participatory model, that is not a capitalist model. I mean, in a sense, it is a, it is a democratic model that puts the public purpose front and center, not uh, you know, the, the pursuit of profit. And it is a job creation on entirely different principles, I would say, for the very reason that the public sector in general does not work for profit, it works for public purpose. And this is one public purpose it, it fulfills. So I think that it's really unfortunate that we aren't quite able to kind of expand our imagination and see how can we employ a structural policy that stabilizes the economy better and empowers uh, the public good through um, through a job guarantee. Yeah, I mean, I think it's true. Uh, the, 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 your answer there absolutely resonates with me, and it's kind of persuading perhaps some people on the left, particularly, to kind of uh, recalibrate their thinking because they're almost stuck in a certain way of thinking about work that, and they've got to break out of. Um, the next question, I, I think I, I know what your answer will be, but because um, you kind of alluded to it, but if you had somebody who came to you and said, oh, well, wouldn't it be best just to raise the minimum wage, you know, so that isn't that better than a job guarantee? What, what, what would you respond to that type of question? I mean, this is this is exactly what's happening in the United States right now. Yeah. I mean, the you know the politics are such that there is a lot of appetite to raise the minimum wage from seven yeah. twenty five to fifteen. Yeah. Long yeah. overdue. We should do it absolutely. Um, that seems to be a focal point of the current administration and the staff. But uh, raising the minimum wage is not an employment policy. It's not a you know uh, it's a policy that improves the working conditions of those who can secure jobs. But, you know, there are many, many people who cannot secure jobs and there may be some marginal effect. I mean, there are some local studies that show that if you increase the wages, you might actually have positive multipliers, improve the well-being of the community, maybe a few extra jobs. You're not going to create jobs for everybody who wants a job. And so, you know, as you have heard me say many times, um, yeah. the, the wage of the unemployed is, is zero. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so it's it's all well and good, but... I mean, in the book, I I, are, I make a little bit of more of a you know economic argument about it that um, to be able to offer a decent wage floor, price support, right? To be able to offer a price support, you don't want just a price a, a, a price policy, price support policy. You must also have an employment policy at the same yeah. time. And so I use um, Bill Mitchell's example of, of commodity buffer stocks because you are absolutely never going to be able to support the price of soybeans unless you are prepared to buy the excess or sell, release it on the market as needed. It will be a completely ineffective price support for soybeans, right? So... Um, so it's the same thing with wages. It's all well and good to provide minimum 15, but unless you're prepared to offer that wage offer to those who cannot secure it in the private sector, it's not effective. And by the way, unemployment will be used by the private sector to erode the floor, or if it's not the legal wage, other conditions that will be cost-saving devices. So you might get your wage, but you may get, you know, crowded working conditions, you know, other, you know, a sh shorter working week benefits, you know, mm. they'll be skimming yeah. off in other ways. So you want to establish the standard through the job guarantee. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. It makes good sense to me. The next question is a little more sort of imaginative rather than theoretical, I think. It's it's this idea that, you know, some towns or parts of countries, uh, if you like, they're dynamic workers, often the younger workers, the more schools kind of leave, maybe. And and so you might think, well, maybe the, the area itself has gone into a bit of decline. There's not many jobs around. Maybe the, the most go-ahead workers have gone. How, how could you envisage a job guarantee helping those types of communities? I mean, look, we talk a lot about labor mobility and economics. Yeah. You know, like yeah, somehow yeah. this is wonderful thing that, you know, people are going to be, you know, you know, going from East Coast to West Coast for jobs. You know, you want to do this on the proper terms. 
You don't yeah. want to do this, you know, labor mobility on the terms of economic insecurity. If young people are leaving because there are no opportunities yeah. in the um, in the place where they've lived, you know, what good is that labor mobility? Yeah. But if you create um, economic opportunities in the small town, perhaps your family has had a, you know, a bakery for decades and decades. I mean, we have here <laughs> and where I live, like there's a chocolatier who yeah. has lived, who's been here since um, 1928, I believe. So survived the Great Depression, worked uninterrupted. And, you know, I live in a community that, you know, is working class community has gone through all sorts of phases of ups and downs and they have survived. So um, we're the children of the folks that are working there. Yeah. You know, uh, if if they wish to carry on with the family business, um, you know, the job guarantee will provide the kind of economic life, will breathe an economic life, or may provide uh, at least like a stepping stone, right? Um, so, so I think that that's what I would say. It's okay for people to move on and move elsewhere, but if they're doing it because you know there's just abject mm -hmm. poverty, then uh, it's not an ideal situation. I mean, what we are facing in in the U.S. is, of course, you know, mining communities mm -hmm. who have relied on you know um, uh, mining for for decades and decades. So, how do you turn those around? Mm -hmm. It will require a lot more than a job guarantee, but without it, I'm not sure that's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we will need. So, you know, Appalachian communities in the U.S., for example, are recognizing also the environmental damage that mining has done. So there are various plans for rehabilitation, for filling up mines, making man-made lakes, maybe attracting tourism, hiking. It's beautiful. So there are ways to do this and you need massive investment clearly but you also need the, the employment component and i think this is what most people are missing that if just you bring in the contract it's going to be enough you also have to bring in this the assurance that a person can jump on that project and they can you know they can participate so the you know the jobs component is i wouldn't think of it as a as a artifact mm -hmm of, of uh, a public investment uh, a project, but as a critical component that has to be embedded in any contract. If we're going to be doing a Green New Deal, we're going to guarantee jobs for people in that community. Yeah, that all makes sense. Again, Pavlina, I I mean, the other thing, of course, you'll come across all is the argument about inflation. You know, if we, if we offer people, you know, well-paid job guarantee, isn't it going to be inflationary? Uh, and also, I wonder if you could counter that. And also, perhaps this might be a good point for you to, uh, if you would, just outline for the listeners, viewers, a little bit about how it the job guarantee is in of itself, you know, an inflation anchor and therefore a crucial, you know, part of MMT's overarching approach. Yeah, um, maybe I'll start with the second part. Yeah, yeah. That um, the, you know, the public sector has the exclusive privilege, right, mm -hmm. to issue the currency, the final kind of me means of payment, right? Yeah. So if you know if it is the, that exclusive power to issue a currency, that's connected also to you know what your audience knows the tax imperative behind the currency that the, yeah. the tax is there to create demand for the currency because the public sector needs resources. Okay. Yeah. So if the public sector is imposing a non-reciprocal tax obligation, something you cannot avoid, right? If you can't escape that tax, and if that tax creates demand for currency that is unsatisfied, that will show up in the form of unemployment. I mean, actually, yeah. the very fact that somebody has to look for currency to pay a tax is already unemployment, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right. It's like you say, OK, here, pay me, you know, magical Pavlina paper notes. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly am unemployed in paper notes. Right. If, yeah. I, if I cannot uh, escape that that obligation, that's immediately unemployment. So the, the government has absolutely the responsibility to solve the problem it it causes for inception mm -hmm. from inception. And yeah. if the government that has the exclusive privilege to issue the, the paper notes does not provide them, not just in equal number, but in a manner that chokes off that demand, 
Yeah. Then it has failed. It's it's entirely the you know the basic very basic functions. Yeah. And so a lot of people say you just spend a lot more paper notes and they're going to find themselves into yeah. the economy. That happens. You know, we have net saving desires. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to save some of them. Somebody else will be looking for them and not find them. Mm -hmm. So it is yeah. the public sector's responsibility to provide them to those who need them. So that's that's number one. How is that an inflation anchor? Well, then you have the responsibility of doing it in a sustainable way. If I give you know, one unemployed person, like one paper note today, but the second unemployed person, two paper notes, then suddenly I have, uh, I have devalued the currency, right? The same hour yeah. of work is worth two, not one. And so, so that's the, the price setting power that the public sector has, we discussed earlier, right? Yeah. So what you could do through the job guarantee is say, well, you know, um, an hour of work is going to be equal to $15 full stop. That is, I've already defined, you know, the so-called, you know, basic mm -hmm. anchor um, um, through establishing the basic wage. Now, because the, 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 pub, the, the job guarantee is the floor, mm -hmm. that will be a floor for other wages in the economy. Okay. So, yeah. you know, if, if we raise it up, yeah, there's going to be, a bump up in some in some prices. Okay. But why is it not inflationary? First, because the public sector is not redefining it from one to two to three, right? So you're not redefining yeah. um, the, the value of that one hour work or redefining down the value of the currency. So that's an anchor. Number two, yeah. the program is, as we say, anti-cyclical. The program shrinks when there is an economy that is um, growing and might yeah. be overheating. So whatever addition to the economy, um, rather, uh, the government actually reduces its contribution to the economy when the economy picks up. So it's a damper, right? When yeah. the economy slumps and it falls into a deflationary <clears throat> spiral or you know, a recessionary environment, the government offsets. So that is the very basic straightforward function for any automatic stabilizer. Any. Unemployment does that same job. You know, we throw money at the problem. You know, we provide unemployment insurance anti-cyclically. We add support in a recession, remove it when people find jobs. But we also spend a lot more on anti-poverty programs, on the social problems that come with unemployment. Yeah. So yeah. all of that is automatic stabilizer. Yeah. Like when people get sicker, government spends more on medication because yeah. they do get sicker from unemployment. Yeah. That's automatic stabilizer. Yeah. So, but what we're doing with the job guarantee, we're doing it better. We're yeah. saying we're going to just provide the jobs and we're going to reduce all of these costs, real and financial, on all these other expenditures. So actually what I want to say about that is that the irony of MMT's popularity is that we, you know, the, the detractors are saying that we are advocating runaway spending when in fact, we are advocating for more disciplined spending than what is happening at the moment. You know, we give enormous subsidies mm -hmm. to companies to create jobs and tax benefits and contracts. Mm -hmm. And there are not that many jobs created. You know, the bang yeah. for the buck is low. So actually, it's a lot more, I would say, um, you know, lavish, you could even say wasteful spending that is happening in an unemployment paradigm than yeah. if we had a job guarantee. Yeah, I mean, I, I always think MNT is much stronger on inflation than orthodox economics. That's the irony of it. People don't get that, you know, and, and I think that's why your answer is very valuable. Uh, now, the thing is, Pavlina, I'm really enjoying listening to you and we've already had an hour. It's whizzed by. So what? And I've got a few questions left, so I must apologise for that. But I'm going to merge a few just to so we can blend them. So I'm... I, I'm there's so many questions on the job guarantee, but one is I'll kind of try and put three into one in a way, and you might have to blend them. Uh, firstly, w would you envisage having different job guarantee rates for different areas, depending on how prosperous they were in, in one country? Uh, what sort of jobs maybe would would people do in a, a sort of examples of that? And also, in terms of just the mechanics, people are asking, like, how long would it take to get embedded? Now, obviously, it depends on, but in a country like, say, the UK, or uh, 
how quickly could you envisage it getting going? You know, so I don't know if you can blend those answers, but because it's five past, uh, seven minutes past, I'm trying to get through them all. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll be quick. It's a national program, so it's nationally funded, but because it's locally administered, they will be yeah. different job guarantees, no doubt. Coastal yeah. areas are going to need job guarantee dealing with uh, coastal restoration. The uh, flooded area in the Midwest will need a job guarantee to deal with some of those problems. Fire prevention in California. Um, how quickly can it be up and running? You know, we have we know this. It, it, during the Great Depression, um, massive public uh, works projects were up and running between four and six months. It's exactly the same time that it took um, in Argentina, when the economy was going through their crisis in 2001, the program I studied. So uh, we need planning. I think it will not take long as long as we have the mandate, because at least in the United States, we already have communities and community programs that are dealing with these social deprivations. We just need to authorize them to employ more people. Yeah. Do you... Uh do you think, you know, Warren talks about the idea of a job guarantee as like a transition job, you know, so you go in that until you move on to maybe a, a different public sector program, a uh, more established structure or the private sector. Do, do you envisage significant numbers of people staying on a job guarantee program? And would that be a problem if they did, you know? Um, it, since we have permanent unemployment on ongoing basis, even in the best of times, I would imagine that there will be people permanently in the public uh, employment program. And that is OK, uh, because the costs of unemployment are extraordinary. They're very big uh, mm -hmm. social costs. They extend to uh, the family and children of the unemployed. So providing the safety net is without a doubt a better scenario than having folks uh, in unemployment. I, I think they probably will be still some uh, unemployment, but it's not going to be in the strictest sense involuntary. You know, if yeah. I lose my job and I choose not to take a job at 15 an hour, then in a sense, I'm voluntarily unemployed. It's not an ideal scenario because I want to find jobs suitable with my skill. So we need to have other ways in which we make the labor market better, more robust. But um, it, is, uh, it is an improvement over the, the current scenario. And the employment program, the job unity will be smaller. Now, if you look at countries who have dealt with direct employment and um, uh, employer last resort policies, you know, you look at Sweden, you look at Japan, they didn't quite have the job guarantee, but they had a commitment to full employment over the long run. The unemployment rate was stable. Right. It was right. low, one, two percent and stable. When you don't have commitment to full employment, you have huge yo-yo up and down, up and down, very volatile system. So I expect with a, in a job guarantee world to have much better private sector employment conditions. Yeah. Much more stable conditions. Yeah. And, and uh, there's a couple of questions. One's about the idea of having higher education students as part of some sort of job guarantee scheme. I don't know if you've come across that. And the other one, the idea of a, a junior job guarantee where you have people maybe high school age, you can have like the idea of part time job guarantee employment while have you come across these? What do you think there's any merit in these suggestions? Um, so we, we have lots of apprenticeships programs and also yeah. there have been direct employment programs for youth, both in the United States, but by the way, also in the UK that have yeah. shown to be very successful. So absolutely, this will be uh, part of, of the program. You target the program for the people and their needs, right? So if they're yeah, yeah. veterans, if they're youth, if they're people with disabilities, if they're, uh, you know, uh, care, caregivers transitioning into the market, you, you target the program. I am, uh, you know, I'm a supporter of one one wage for all. There's, you know, right. something very democratizing about it. Um, yeah. And also, you you we have stronger macroeconomic effects. If you have many many tiers and different wage levels, you're starting to compete across yeah. the wage distribution with private sector employment. It's not going to be as stabilizing and the buffer stock feature is not going to be as strong yeah. as if it were um, just the base anchor wage. Yeah. Um, now, th this is the thorny question, uh, Pavlina, on that. Now, the thing is, as you know, a lot of progressives or people on the left, they're very keen on this idea of a UBI. Uh, and it's an ongoing debate about UBI, job guarantee, job guarantee plus a basic income for those who 
How would you say you were faced with a very well-meaning progressive who's passionate about the UBI, and I've met these people, uh, faced a few at the Green Party conference, which the Gims girls will remember. They just are so like, the UBI is their dream. You know, for them, people will have a load of money and go away and paint and go fishing and stuff, and uh, it'll be wonderful. And the job guarantee, they just don't buy it. How would you approach that type of person? If someone's well-meaning, not, not a you know, a, a right winger, but someone who really sees the UBI as, you know, a passport to utopia. How, what, how, what would be your response to them? I mean, okay. So many <laughs> ways. I've also been talking to folks, you know, since. Yeah, I'm about, sure. Yeah, have, yeah, yeah. I have a couple of papers uh, on, on this issue. And, you know, the first thing is I would say, you know, don't worry. Uh, we can pay for your UBI. You don't need to fret. Yeah. We, yeah. We've got the financial resources. The question is, um, you know, it actually is is a bit problematic within the macro system that we, within which we uh, we work in. But I mean, just without going into you know monetary theory and the reason for the yeah. you know, from an MMT perspective, if you tax, you are creating demand for the currency. If you are providing it for free, you have defeated the reason why you tax. Yeah. Right, you have completely undermined, and the reason why you tax is because you want to bring resources for collective provisioning. Now, UBI folks who do not believe in collective provisioning, it's very difficult to discuss and and argue. But yeah. folks that actually believe that the community as a whole needs to provision for you know for itself, then um, uh, we have a lot more common ground because uh, what we can do is recognize that there is an enormous amount of work that has to be done. You. you you know, you know, I'm a person with income, you know, thank God, I'm lucky, fortunate, I have trouble accessing some basic necessities, like affordable childcare. You know, if you give me more money, will I will I have the childcare in my community that, you know, that I need? It is not, um, it's not the case. So income, providing the income is the easy part. The question is, how do we provision? Who's going to do the work? Who, uh, where is the work going to be done? Uh, what are the resources that you can get with that income? You know, will the slumlords uh, extract that basic income um, in the form of, uh, you know, higher rent? So I, I find that it is really a very alluring kind of siren song. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's so easy to send everybody a check, but the problems are real and they're deeper and they're more complex and you require work to do them. And so you yeah. cannot be philosophically opposed to work. You have to, you know, you have to then think through, like, how shall we mobilize the community? And I have always said that my proposal from the bottom up participatory proposal is much closer to participatory income, uh, which yeah. you know finds a fair amount of support in the UBI literature than anything else. So we have things that we can work on together rather than kind of have this antagonistic relationship. But there are UBI folks with whom I will not agree because yeah. UBI is used to displace an existing welfare safety net and provide um, the privilege for firms, especially tech firms, to pay whatever they want, right? Yeah. We don't want a system like that. Yeah. We want to hold their feet to the fire and have a public option for jobs rather than subsidize you know, their ability to pay poverty wages with an yeah. UBI. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree on that point. Now, uh, this is a sort of a, a question where we're asking you to sort of envisage a little bit. You know, with the COVID crisis, people are starting to think about lots of things. Do you think that has the COVID crisis opened the door a bit for job the job guarantee in, in some areas where maybe it was closed? And what is your thinking, you know, if you're envisaging the post-COVID world, has, has COVID done anything? Has it done the job guarantee advocacy any favours? Um, it's hard to say. Um, yeah. in the, on the one hand, people are staring into a very uh, big jobless recovery. Yeah. So in that sense, it has been a positive. You know, people yeah. say, how do we quickly get out of this? Yeah. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, folks in the UBI camp will also claim some victory mm. there. They say, oh, look, you know, the government can send checks. Of course it can send yeah. checks. Nobody ever denied that. But 
what the gap that I see, what's missing is that you can and should have a job guarantee during a pandemic as well. Uh, we have so many um, you know, areas of uh, public health that are understaffed, so many. Mm -hmm. I mean, from field clinics to testing sites to contact tracing to whatever. I mean, there's just, and, and the thing is, the climate problems are not going away. They, just because there's yeah, a yeah. pandemic, they don't just stop. <laughs> you know, and go home. We still have these acute problems and environmental work, you know, green work, which the job guarantee has always been green, um, is very uh, amenable to uh, conditions, uh, you know, pandemic conditions. Now, in India, the example that I used, the demand for uh, the job guarantee just shot through the roof. They, most people exhausted their guaranteed days halfway through mm -hmm. the year. They wanted a job guarantee to double up the days it will guarantee employment. And it was the only program that actually provided employment relief to people. So right. we do real, we, we do understand that we can send people checks and they can uh, mm. pay the bills. Um, but we also understand that there is work that needs to be done. And we don't know what's at the end of this pandemic. Like the, the job guarantee is really the only bridge that assures a uh, rapid transition to employment. And uh, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my, I want to leave a little time for the audience, uh, Favlina. I don't know how long you've got, but if you, if you can go a little longer. And I, uh, This is a question from Neil, who's uh, a Gims associate, you may know. Uh, he's asked, is there a minimum viable product for a job guarantee? And how could you envisage it? You know, like if you try to describe what it might be. The minimum viable product? Yeah, of a job guarantee. I mean, I, I may be misinterpreting Neil's question, but it's like, how much should someone uh, on a job guarantee be producing, you know, to, to merit? Is Or can that be quantified? And I'll apologise to Neil if I'm misconstruing his question. Okay, so, I mean, I would say, I would say no. And I think, may, you know, if, if we're understanding Neil's question, yeah. um, you see, in orthodox economics, there is this yeah. presumption that the wage should reflect the marginal product, you know, the additional product of a person. Yeah. Um, the reality is that this is a purely theoretical concept. It is yeah. in very few circumstances can you actually measure the product, uh, the specific product, you know, maybe in some agricultural areas, you know, how many crates of apples you filled and, uh, you know, in some factory settings. The vast majority of the economy is a service economy. You cannot figure yeah. out the marginal product of a nurse you can't figure out the marginal product of a, of a, of a teacher assistant or librarian um, or yeah. a transportation worker. So, so what I would say is that um, that's not how we typically measure anyway one's a contribution to the workplace. Now, yeah. in the private sector, of course, they're profit producers. They're a whole different calculus. But here we're dealing with public needs. You know, and so when you are planting trees, there's no commercial return. Um, I think that, you know, like in every in every um, um, project, you will have goals and benchmarks yeah. to achieve. We want to plant a billion trees. What would it take? So you reverse engineer the problem. You know, how many people would we need? Um, so if we have efficiency in the engineering sense. You know, how many people yeah. do we want to have? Uh, how quickly can we, you know, administer shots in arms for the vaccine? You know, that's, yeah. that's one way of doing it. But because, you know, work is not... Um, standardized, you won't be able to provide the specific guidelines for these things. They have to be project based. And yeah. as I was saying in, um, in the India case, the public sector provides about 200 plus general areas of concern that will yeah. need work to be done. And then the municipalities figure out how to staff them. So for environmental work in you know, how many mangroves do you want to plant? You know, how many recycling, how much cleanup, how fast do you want to clean up the river? Those will be the sorts of questions we'll be asking, right? Um, yeah. uh, and I'm not sure that they, that should be necessarily a criteria for evaluation to hold on to a person because yeah. the, the reason why you hold on to them is because they don't, they need the job and, you know, right. the, not yeah. having it brings the other costs. 
And the, and the other is the second part of Neil's question, uh, which seems to me quite a philosophical question, if I may interpret it correctly. I mean, what he's really saying that something like a state pensions embedded in our culture, you know, it's part of the way we think. Uh, how big would a job guarantee have to be to be embedded? And do you think it can, you know, how long would it take to be to get that, to, to be sort of embedded in the way we think about it? Uh, if again, if I've interpreted him correctly, you know, yeah, no, it's it's a really interesting question to actually work. Yeah, it's no, it's very it's very interesting because I think it is a question about the structure of the rest of the economy. Right? I think it is a question about right. you know, how big should the private sector be relative to the public sector. I think that that's a philosophical question today, with or without the job guarantee, because yeah. you know there's a kind of systematic retrenchment of the public sector. Uh, because of the dominance, you know, obviously of private concerns. I think that there is one, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, a major benefit of the job guarantee is that it removes the threat of unemployment from the toolkit of the, you know, of the private, you know, uh, of the private sector in guiding policy, right? You know, the the I think the threat yeah. of unemployment is kind of pernicious in very invisible ways. And so it, once you remove that, um, then you put the public purpose on the scale a little bit more, right, um, than, you know, the private interest. Now, you know, there, there would be different scenarios. As I was uh, saying, the India case, 30% uh, of households actually avail themselves of the job guarantee. That's a lot. 30% of households use the job guarantee. Now, in, in Argentina... Wow. About 5%, right, or 13% of the labor force, you know, took up the, the job guarantee. And then there are small job guarantee projects. Yeah. So at what point does it become part and parcel of the fabric? Um, I think, you know, yeah. it, once it's permanent, it will be um, something that people know about, like an employment insurance. But its size, right, uh, would depend, I think, on what's happening elsewhere in the economy. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I've, um, thank you, Pavlina. I'm, I'm looking at some questions that I've been sent. There's one from Steve Russell, and it says, uh, do you see any particular, the particularly promising platforms, institutions that could be used to help implement the job guarantee? And he's given an example of upvote systems to prioritise local community jobs. So I guess how... Are there institutions maybe in the US or other places you've studied, which maybe platforms, media platforms that help people to know what's out there? Yeah, uh, it will really depend on, on the context, the specific context. Um, as I said, the village councils in rural India are very appropriate uh, place to do this. Um, in Argentina, the 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 makeup of society is such that there are a lot of small labor unions, very small political organizations on the ground that we don't have in the United States. Those were um, the engine for creating the projects and lobbying and hiring, uh, you know, uh, talking to people, members and hiring people. Um, in the United States, um, I would say in a, you know, a developed country, ideally you would want to have, you know, the public sector uh, with its um, various uh you know, ministries and institutions um, to kind of guide that work. I'll give you an example in, in Brussels, for example, there is a, a youth guarantee that's very interesting and very successful. There is a enormous resources that have been dedicated from the public sector, a whole found institution, government institution that manages and, and does that. Whereas in the United States, we, we don't quite have these things. And yet on the ground in the localities, we have a lot of... Um, uh, community groups and uh, nonprofit work that tends to fill that gap. So for the United States, I have proposed that it will be a combination of local, um, you know, city council, you know, municipality employment, uh, municipality yeah. created projects, but also in conjunction with these uh, nonprofit community groups that are already doing a lot of that work. Yeah, uh, thank you, um Pavlina for that. I've got one more question I've been sent, which I'm going to try and uh, read out to you. May, how, how complicated? It looks a long question, Pavlina. So um, it says, given that governments of democracies respond to the sort of wishes and desires of their electorate, uh, how can... Um, 
how can we kind of dislodge the current paradigm, uh, if you like, and uh, make it more uh, the way we think about economics? How can it reflect more what, what people really want? I mean, it's a, it's a slightly more philosophical question. Well, um, you know, I think... It's quite a tricky one, that You probably need a book on that. <laughs> yes, you do. But you see, I think the bottleneck is at the top. I think that the bottleneck is at the policy right. level. If, um, if there were a Rooseveltian a president that says, well, we're just going to do this and we're going to put it in place as a permanent policy, then um, I think it would be workable. If you give an unemployed person a job, it's incredibly empowering. It is very good policy at every yeah. level. Like we knew that during the New Deal, there were so many people who switched party. They, they call so-called Roosevelt Democrats because they were yeah, hungry. Yeah. They, they had good jobs. Roosevelt provided them. Uh, it has enormous you know, political potential in addition to uh, the economic benefits we listed. I should say, um, you know, and I have some of that uh, data in my book. Um, there are various surveys. Some of them have been um, in the United States done since the late 60s. You know, um, we've been running these questions. Should the government be responsible for guaranteeing em employment or providing employment for those who don't have it? And upwards of 68 percent consistently people respondents uh, reply. And more recently, the job guarantee, you know, now that it's been talked about uh, in the media has been polled and, you know, the, the support is stronger even than that um, in the 70s, uh, high 70s, depending. And even in the very conservative areas in the United States, I think YouGov did, did a similar uh, survey for the UK. Again, 71% support, I think they found yeah. for the UK and the US is very similar. And it is bipartisan. So I think that, um, yes, there will always be the ideology out there that our government can do X, Y, and Z. But if the government just did it, people benefit from it, right? Whatever, yeah. whatever the, the ideology is. So I think, you know, you have to overcome the political hurdle to put it in place. Um, you know, everybody is using a snowplow in the United States and is yeah. driving over a bridge. And, you know, no matter how much you rant and rave of, you know, about the government ineffectiveness, you know, it's it's like essential. And I think the job guarantee in similar ways uh, will become something that, you know, people can access and it will be, you know, a comfort and assurance. You go to the unemployment office, you know, you can walk out with a job. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just getting a question in from Deborah. OK, thanks, Fablina. Uh She's just noticed about long-term unemployment the last four decades. Um, so, uh, yeah, so in the last four decades, we've uh, had manufacturing extractive industries like the, like the mining um, issue in the US. You know, um, how, how would you see the job guarantee as a crucial element to sort of rebalancing between public and private sector jobs in these areas could you kind of shed a bit more light on that how how the there'd be that rebalancing structure through the job guarantee in these very depressed areas if you like yeah i mean it's uh you know you know you have something concrete in hand to yeah. do the transition i mean a yeah. lot of this transition is happening you it's it's almost outside of our control we yeah. know that the you know the economy is much less reliant on manufacturing and it's more of a service economy. We know that we're experiencing existential climate problems. Yeah. And, um, and we know that, you know, services too are also under provisions. I mean, you know, it's the growing sector, but it's the growing sector of precarious work and yeah. un understaffed work. So um, we've got nothing concrete to hold on to, to make this transition easier and better. And so, to clean up a community from the devastation, the pollution of, you know, previous whatever extractive services, it just takes somebody to do the work. And yeah. if we have the job guarantee as that piece that's embedded in every legislation, you know, we say in, in the green projects, you know, you want to have a component in the, you know, legislative yeah. component that says employ the unemployed from the community, guaranteed, yeah. guaranteed. And whatever the needs of that particular community are, then 
it's a very visible, tangible, concrete policy that's there rather than waiting for the magic of the market and incentives mm -hmm. to somehow, you know, get people to, you know, pick up and, you know, initiate the kind of sustainable job creation. Um, you won't be able to incentivize enough. We cannot incentivize them fast enough, right? The climate yeah. problems are barreling towards us and we, we, we need immediate action. So I think it has, especially in the climate agenda, that's why I think it's, it's so important. Um, you know, the job guarantee is kind of the, the essential piece. Yeah. Well, Pavlina, there's so many questions flying in. I'm going to call it a day there. And what I'd like to do is just to thank you on behalf of all the listeners and viewers uh, to say how much we've learned, how much I've learned. And uh, uh, that is one fast hour and a half for me. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, just in conclusion, if you haven't read Pavlina's book, The Case for the Job Guarantee. It's not a long book, but it's packed full of insight, You're not to embarrass. It's a brilliant book. Please get hold of that. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, please remember to support the GIMS. Okay, they are a fantastic organization. Also, Christian and Patricia and their work in the MMT podcast. Uh, I'll just pass over to Pavlina if she has got any closing words to you budding MMTers out there or some experienced MMTers as well. So I don't know if you want to say anything to, in conclusion, Pavlina. Uh, no, only thank you, really. I uh, This is so important. And thank you to Gims. I, I think... Uh, you know, the the more we we expect and demand in our conversations that uh, you know people look at these you know these these questions, I think the you know that's the only way that the change happens. You know, um, raise you know uh, raise some hell, I would say. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much wow. uh, for for the conversation. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, thank you, Pavlina. And we're all trying to do that over here. Thank you again. Bye bye thank now. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. That was the MMT podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino, and you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.